that. And when I say that, I'm thinking about the fact that we're all going to be around the throne. And all the stuff that we read in the Bible and all the stuff we preach, it is real. And as much as you call yourself a believer, and maybe I'm, hopefully I'm not the only one, there comes periods in your mind sometimes you start doubting, you start questioning, and all you go through things, you're like, is this stuff really real? Yeah, it's really real. And just like Brother Dale prayed, Miss Sue is in the presence of the Lord right now. She is there. And when the Lord returns, we're going to have a resurrection, a rapture, and a reunion. And we'll be caught up together with them, and we're going to be around that throne. The multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of us. So it's going to be great, and we need to be reminded. And it is, I don't know, man, I'm just, I, I get anxious, like Brother Dale prayed. You know, you just want to go ahead and just let, let this life go. It's just, even so come Lord Jesus. And so I want to encourage you too, if you have a special, maybe for the next few weeks, be praying about that and get with Brother Chris. And um, if you have, we don't have the hymn books and everything, we're just kind of avoiding, you know, congregational singing for the moment. But if you have a special, we do need some specials each week. And we know that uh, that'll be a blessing to us. All right, let's take our Bibles. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter number five. If you'd like to stand with us. I think I'm all muted. All right, take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter number 5. If you'd like to stand with us here, Mark chapter number 5. <clears throat> we'll begin reading in verse number 21. Mark chapter 5, verse number 21. I know some of you might be a little uncomfortable. You don't have your Doritos with you um, <laughs> and to be able to watch and everything. But uh, So I don't have a bag to share, or I would. Mark chapter number 5, verse number 21. The Bible says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. I'm going to ask Brother, uh, Brother Jim Graham, will you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message for us, please. Dear Lord, uh, it's so good to be back in church, to be, uh, be in the house of worship, to, to see our friends again. Uh, that we, we pray that you would keep this uh, coronavirus from, uh, from our midst. We pray that you would uh, uh, be with uh, Brother Jim that uh, Amen. has the coronavirus and heal him up. We pray that uh, the message we receive today uh, about the healing power of Jesus Christ be, be, be brought again to our attention that, to know that He can save and heal whoever is in His will to do so. We pray that you would uh, be with us, go with us, and guide us, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now obviously from the passage, I do want to focus on the latter part of that passage, not Jairus' daughter, but the woman that has the issue of blood. And it's interesting because here we find ourselves in a time to where, you know, you're not supposed to be touching anybody. Now if you are married, obviously you still need to give a hug and give a kiss and that kind of a thing. But 
If you're around friends and so forth and people at work, you know, the idea is to be away from people because germs can get on you and that kind of a deal. So the whole thing now is for so many weeks now, people have been staying away from each other. And the thing is, don't touch. Don't get germs. Don't get sick. Watch what you put your hands on. It's kind of like you ever been to the hot dog stand. You go to Lowe's and there's the guy selling the sausage dogs out there. Man, they're always the best. Sometimes they get the ones from Bradley store in Tallahassee. They'll, that's where they get them. And you go in there and uh, they got those Bradley sausages cooking. And you go up there and you get your dog. And you go over there and you grab a hold of that mustard thing that 1,500 other people have grabbed a hold of. And you grab a hold of that ketchup thing. And you dip that relish. It's got a little bit of other white stuff in it that you don't know what it is. A uh, previous person had sneezed in it. And then you put it all over that and uh, you take it and you eat it. That's just what we're used to. You go up and you grab that money and you grab that card and you touch this, you touch this door handle, you touch this person. And when I shake somebody's hand, if I hadn't seen them for a long time or if it's you know, kind of a, 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 a more excited type of gathering, I'll shake their hand and maybe pat them on the side of the arm. Or if it's a real close friend or somebody you had not seen, you'll grab them, shake their hand and give them a hug. Really get close. And that is how we are personally, and I believe that's physiologically, that's very healthy to feel a touch. The psychologi psychologists, they call this contact comfort. You go for so long without being touched at all by another human being, it has an effect on you. Now we're dealing with a situation here in this passage as you see from the text. The woman just knows I have to get close enough to Jesus to touch Him. I want to preach to you this morning on this subject. You can always touch Jesus. Amen. Now if you come up to somebody that's sick and they're sneezing and they're hacking and you start touching them and you get sick, well you got what's coming to you. You know, well, stay away. But Jesus Christ can always be touched. And I want to encourage you this morning in our weird culture that we're living in right now, and I know everything's kind of out of balance, your Christian life does not have to be out of balance. Your relationship with Jesus Christ does not have to be out of balance. As a believer in Christ, we still have the Bible. We still have the Holy Spirit. We still have the Son of God that all of us can touch Him. Matter of fact, he wants us to touch him. He don't have, there's no corona on him. Corona be gonna on Jesus Christ. Amen? I was hoping Sister Lynn would sing that song this morning. No, just kidding. Uh, you said I hadn't seen that. Well, I won't, I won't spare you the details. You don't need to see it. But uh, Jesus Christ does not have COVID. You can touch Jesus Christ. Now, you'll notice in our text as we examine it here, there's a problem. And first of all, there's a people problem. Notice in verse 24, Jesus is coming up here and all of these people are, are surrounding Christ. I mean, they know who He is, how He is the miracle worker. It says there that the people thronged Him. And Jairus had gotten word about his daughter and he's headed in that direction. And the people, as they hear about Jesus, they follow in the crowds and the word begin to spread. And the people are all over the place. And really, when you think about this, this is a problem. We have a people problem in our world right now. And I tell people this, the few people I get to get out and be around, uh, it's a great time to be a witness. You can't always give out tracts because people don't want to take nothing from you now. You might have sneezed on it. So, you know, I understand that. But uh, you can say something like, hey, I know something a whole lot worse than the COVID vi virus. The sin virus. There's a 100% death and, and hell rate with the sin virus. And Jesus Christ can heal you of the sin virus. Now, you have this situation here where people see that people are the problem. If you've got all these people that are infected, they need to be quarantined and they need to be isolated. And the psychologists are trying to tell us that uh, distancing doesn't mean isolation because you're going to have some problems if you don't talk to somebody for six weeks or you don't see somebody for six or eight weeks or however long they want you to stay locked up in your closet. And so you have a problem with people. People affect other people. Do you know there's been a lot of false teachers and preachers that have led multitudes astray? 
There have been a lot of fathers and leaders in their homes that have led their families astray. There have been friends that because a friend was a follower instead of a leader, they got in the car when they shouldn't have got in the car. They went somewhere when they shouldn't have. People will get in the way of you touching Jesus Christ. The press. Do I have to say anything about the press? Thank God we have the media. The media is our salvation. Because they always tell the truth. Um, the, the press, the people, will get in the way. You say, what, what will it be? It could be frivolous things. It could be entertainment. What are we going to do without the movies? What are we going to do without being able... Preachers have been praying for years that the bars get closed on Sunday. They finally did. <laughs> of course, the churches did too, so... But you can't, you can't close your relationship with Christ. Just because you can't come to church doesn't mean you can't touch Jesus. But we have a people problem. Ever since the Garden of Eden, there has been a problem with us getting close to God. It's because of sin. And people, the sin in the people, and the multitudes have kept this lady. She's trying to get close to Christ, and no doubt with her physical restrictions, it's harder for her to weave and press through the crowds. But there's more than just the people problem. Carnal men, Christian men even. I mean, the disciples are like, get away, get away, get away. Can you imagine disciples doing that? Do you think Christians would ever want other people to get away from Jesus? Yeah, they would. And they don't even realize sometimes they're doing it. But let me move on. It's not just a people problem, it's a personal problem. Look in verse 25. The woman which had an issue of blood 12 years... This is her own personal problem. Verse 26, she suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid His face from you. That he, Well, preacher, you know, all those churches teach false doctrine and, and there just ain't no good churches and how do you know which church to believe in? And there's so many people that are perverting the truth and who knows what to believe because of the people. You have a personal problem because you personally, as an individual, can reach out and touch Jesus. Don't be blaming the bad preachers. Don't be blaming the bad deacons. Don't be blaming the bad church people. Don't be blaming the media and the government and everybody else for your personal lack of reaching out to touch Jesus Christ. Well, we just couldn't come to church for six weeks, so I just fell back into sin. Well, if church is the only thing that props you up, you have a whole lot more problems than we realize. You have a personal relationship with Jesus and you should be able to reach out and touch Him. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. If you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit on the inside. You've got the Bible to be your guide and you can reach out and touch Jesus Christ. He had a personal problem. So regardless of the multitudes, regardless of the heretics, regardless of the crazy preachers, of the crazy church members, of the crazy family members, of the crazy whoever's, you need to reach out and touch Jesus. Amen. Now I'm glad we can still find people that we can fellowship with. Don't get me wrong. But personally, we have to reach out and touch. Now notice some things about her personal problem. Number one, she's defiled. She's got this issue of blood 12 years. I mean, this is bad. She's got a virus, if you want to call it that, or a disease. She's destitute. I'm sure she can't be around people because of this. Whatever issue continues to run, she's constantly having to watch herself. She's probably constantly having to clean up, all those types of things. She's pretty much destined. You talk about having to be isolated. You talk about social distancing. Man, this lady is definitely having to do that. Notice also she's got to be discouraged. Can you imagine verse 26? And some of you have been discouraged with doctors and you have to keep going and you try to find another specialist. You try to find this. You go to the, you know, the drug stores. You, know, they're, they're, uh, you go in there and they, don't have two or three, they only have two or three choices. So you try to... No, I'm being funny. And you walk in these things and you got 500 pills for one. Which one do you take? And you try this and you try that and you try that. And she went to all these physicians. Notice she is discouraged. Nothing is working for her. And then notice she's depreciated. 
Her value as a, I don't even know if she's married, the Bible doesn't tell us. She's probably not married, maybe divorced, maybe her kids are gone, maybe she never had kids because of this. She's depreciated. She's just this woman that's got a problem. You don't need to be around us because we don't want to be around nasty. Nobody wants to be around nasty, right? And then she's declining. Look at the last part of verse 26. Nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. I want to say this. The longer you stay away from your Bible, the longer you stay away from prayer, the longer you stay away from touching Jesus, the worse you're going to get. Absence does not make the heart grow fonder. The best thing you can do is try to get close to Jesus as you can and touch Him and get that relationship restored. Now let's talk about her, her push here, the drive, her desire here. Her goal, you can see from the text, was just to touch Him. Now take a left turn and come back to Mark chapter number 3. I want you to see this. Mark chapter number 3. It's a blessing to have some amens to listen to. Amen. Amen. I've been preaching to a camera for too long. I'm still preaching to a camera. We've got some folks watching. Mark chapter 3. All right, Mark chapter number 3. Look down, if you will, in verse number 6. Notice this. The Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. And uh, verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with the disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea. Verse 8. And from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon. A great multitude. When they heard what great things he did, came unto him, and he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him. As many as had plagues and unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Notice, everybody's just trying to get close to Jesus to touch him. We see the same thing. You don't have to turn in Luke chapter number 6. It says in Luke chapter number 6, The whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. So these people, the word's already gotten out. It's not th that you have to you know, put in a request, make sure they save a wheelchair section for you at the Great Crusade, make sure he's got enough respiratory air to breathe on you so you can be healed, or make sure he's got his jacket so he can wave it toward you and you can be in line and be healed, or make sure you send enough money so he can mail you the prayer cloth that you can pray over and be healed. There's none of that stuff going on. They know if they get close enough and touch him, they're healed. Later on, some other guys, the centurion wises up to this. He says, Lord, you don't even have to come. You're powerful enough. Just say the word and I know that my servant will be healed. You're God. God doesn't have to be there. You say, well, you know, preacher, it's kind of hard. We've never seen Jesus. Jesus is here. Where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. If you're saved, he's inside of your body. You say, well, he's way up there in heaven. Yeah, but his presence is with us. You have to realize that. The idea is just in your heart, in your desire, in the innermost part of your being, you reach out and you let go and you fellowship with Him. But you'll notice she had a drive. People knew this and it drew them to Jesus. I am so glad Jesus Christ has arms of invitation out. I'm so glad although salvation is exclusive in the sense of you have to believe on Christ, I'm glad that He offers it to whosoever will. Whosoever will, let him come. He's not shunning you. He's not telling you you're too bad. He's not telling you you're too dirty. He's not telling you you've gone too far. you stayed out of church too long. Aren't you glad you don't get to heaven by going to church? We'd all be on our way to hell. <laughs> Aren't you glad this little cookie and this little juice don't save you? All these people think they drink this stuff and it turns into Jesus. They're not trying to be irreverent, but that's their doctrine. Drinking the juice and eating the bread doesn't save you. Faith in Jesus Christ saves you. And I'm glad that He doesn't push us away. I'm glad that when people know that, it draws them to Him. And Jesus Christ draws the entire world. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. He said, well, I just don't know if God can understand my suffering. If God can understand the trials and all the heartache, just look to Calvary's cross. He understands the suffering. He understands it perfectly. You'll notice here her desperate touch. She's desperate. 
She had spent everything, verse number 26. I mean, she has no uh, government backup plan coming in to bail her out. She doesn't have charity hospitals that are going to help her. Back in this day, when you didn't have anything, you didn't have anything. You sit on the street and beg. She had spent everything. She's desperate. But she's also determined. She heard of Jesus. Verse number 27, she came in the press behind. She's getting a late start. But she is determined. You know, it may take some effort on your part to take the time to spend alone with the Lord. Our phones and internet and everything went out the other day. And it's kind of a blessing. That's kind of a thing when this first happened, I was telling Christy, I was like, you know, this is good that we, you know, kind of get a little break from people being all around people, but everybody's got all their entertainment still. They're going to sit there and watch all their movies and have the world right in their living room anyway. It'd be kind of neat if everything got shut off. Of course, when it did, then you started getting nervous. You're like, hmm, I can't call nobody. But you know, the thing is, you get into a situation to where you have to realize... We have to make the effort to turn the stuff off. Some of you have a back porch, front porch. You need to use it. Just listen to the birds and the evening starts coming in. And as the evening starts to, to come in, you'll start hearing, if you look close to water like we are, you start hearing the frogs whistling. Those frogs start whistling and getting everything set up and then the crickets start in and, and uh, the cicada bugs after the summer starts coming in, the cicada bugs start coming in, if your allergies can take it. Or put your mask on and go out and uh, I've used my mask working in the yard. People say, man, you're really scared of the virus. No, man, I'm just trying to keep the allergies out of my nose. But go out there and, and just spend some quiet time with your Bible and talk to the Lord. But it's going, you're going to have to be determined about it. So, well, I'm so far behind. She was behind, but she was determined to make up some time. She was determined. You know what? I, I, I've lost some years. You know that song, uh, uh, what is that old song? Not precious. Uh, some song, song we hang, sing about uh, wasted years, wasted years, oh how foolish. Yeah, that's it. But you can't just dwell on all the time you've lost. And you can't just dwell on all the time you've wasted with entertainment, with all the other stuff. It's time to just be determined to press through, to come from behind, and spend some time with the Lord. Notice that she's desperate, she's determined, she's devoted. I mean, this, she's serious about this. But here's the interesting thing about it. She goes back, verse number 27. Verse number 28, you'll see her determination, you'll see her devotion. She says, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Look at that faith in verse 28. She knows what she's heard. She's heard the reports. People are being miraculously healed. And she is putting faith in what she hears. You as a believer are to put faith in what you've heard from the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He said in the Bible, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What does that mean? That means you need to have faith in that. He said, uh, be careful for nothing. You need to have faith in that. Don't be in a panic. Have faith. Have faith in God. That's another verse, Luke 18. You need to, what you hear, you need to have faith and exercise. She heard this stuff, so it's a devoted touch. And she says, if I can just touch his clothes, you can always touch Jesus if you can get to him. Now, thank God he is accessible. Thank God for that. Notice in verse number 28, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out, turned about in the press, and said, Who touched my clothes? This is a discovered touch. It's a discovered touch. A lot of people had touched Jesus that day. People were bumping into him. I mean, there was a multitude they were not worried about not touching the ketchup and the mustard. I mean, there was none of that going on. They didn't even know what a germ was back then. You ever think about that in history? How many things that the Lord did not feel obligated to allow man to even know about certain things? And there's a lot of things now he does not feel obligated. You don't even have to know. And the Lord's not going to repent about that. And uh, they're here they are going through this stuff and they're bumping into each other and they're bouncing. And Jesus is being touched by the disciples, by the multitude. But nobody touched him like she touched him. 
she reached out in faith and he knew why she was touching him. It's a discovered touch. Faith is behind the touch. Our verse out on the sign, Brother Hatcher put that out there. They're out of town this week. And uh, I had mentioned just, you know, joking around. I said, yeah, you need to put that verse, you know, cleanse your hands, you sinners. So <laughs> the other day I was up here and he came by and he's like, he's putting the verse out there. I was like, praise the Lord. That's a good verse for this day, you know. Cleanse your hands, you know. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. <laughs> Draw nigh to God is the first part of that, though. And it's kind of like that passage over in John where John the Baptist makes a statement in John chapter number 3. And he makes the, the we often remember the, parse, the, the passage, you know, I must decrease, which is true. But the first part of that verse is, he must increase. What the devil will do is, he'll take your own depravity and your own sin and he'll use it against you. And he'll take it and he'll flip that thing around. Okay, so if you must decrease first, then you got a lot of work to do. You are so vile and you are so unworthy and you are so far behind, you're never going to be good enough, you're never going to be clean enough, you're never going to be holy enough for Him to increase in your life. And so He'll flip that thing around. That's not how the thing works. The thing works like this. Draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. The closer you get to God, the more you will want to clean your hands. The more you'll want to take your shoes off as you get close to that burning fire. Moses died on top of the mountain and he died on top of the mountain. The closer and closer he got to God, the uh, more that his face just shone. And the idea is to kind of, it's a positive thing. You know, we preach on sin and sometimes we focus on it so bad. You're wrong here, you're wrong here, you're wrong here. Guess what? We're all wrong. I guarantee you, as righteous and good as you think you are, if we took some time and you, we put you up here on display, we could all start picking you apart. But here's the positive side of even the gospel. There's repentance, but there's regeneration. There's a positive side. If you'll get close to Him, then what He will do is He will chip away that bad stuff. And if you'll, you have that cup and it's full of all that... Uh, you got, you know, yesterday's coffee in there, and you say, well, I sure want some coffee, but I sure ain't going to wash that cup out. None of you would do that. Talk to Brother Jeff about it. They call it a seasoned coffee cup. Amen? <laughs> you just dump it out, and you leave it, and it gets seasoned. Anyway, <clears throat> you have old coffee in there, whatever. You keep pouring in new stuff, and pouring in new stuff, eventually the old stuff's going to run out. Draw nigh to God. Press through. She's devoted. She has faith. And when she touches Jesus, He knows about it. The Lord knows your heart. He knows your motive. He knows all your faults. He knows all your failures. He's not judging you by that person, by that person, by that person. He will judge you individually. And He's looking at the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, 1 Samuel 15. But God, or 1 Samuel, whatever it is, 13. But God looketh on the heart. It's a discovered touch. Notice the power. Whenever she touches Jesus, notice it's direct. Immediately, Jesus knew, verse number 30. Notice verse number 29. Straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. It's direct. And then notice it's divine. I like how the King James Bible translates this word in verse number 30 as virtue. I don't know what the new Bibles, I really don't care what they translate it, but it's that word for dynamite, you know, dynamos or whatever it is for power. I like how it uses that word virtue. We know it's power. There's the power of God. The Bible talks about the power of the Lord being present to heal them in some of the passages. But a few times in the Gospels it translates that word virtue because it is divine power. The sin problem we have life and the, the virus that we have in our life that keeps us away from the Lord, we can't overcome it by reformation. We can't overcome it just by routine. We can't overcome it just by rules and regulation. We have to come to the place where we rely on the divine power of God, His virtue. That's why He speaks in Peter about add to your faith virtue. It's only Jesus Christ that can do those spiritual things in our lives that we need to be done. You can't do it yourself. 
think there's a passage in Psalms, and I'm reminded of that. He mentions about how frail we are. And sometimes, you know, we kind of get the big head and we think we're pretty good, or we do some project and we build something, or we are healthy, or we are successful about one thing. We kind of get the big head. I think man mankind gets the big head, you know. They build this big old tower, you know, and it falls down. They build one taller than that. They think they're great, you know. Look at what we've done. We're in this together. And that the mantra today, you know. We're in this together. We can say that as a church. I mean, I'm a Christian first. I'm an American second. But I ain't joining up with the world. I don't care what it is. But this idea that men have, you know, we, we've got this. We're in control and we have arrived. And we sometimes get the big head. Sometimes you need to realize that maybe when you deal with your sin problems, your own personal issues in your life, maybe you realize and you look at that, you've got to realize how frail you are and how much you are in need of a touch from Jesus and for you reaching out and touching Him. Jesus touched a lot of people personally. I could have preached on that because he touched the eyes of the blind and he touched people that were possessed and he would touch a lot of people. But this puts it back on us. We need to reach out and just touch the hem of his garment. When you see how frail you are, you realize you're in need of his virtue. Because our minds go places they shouldn't go. Our thoughts go places they shouldn't go. Spiritual sins, physical sins, fleshly sins, carnal sins. But a divine touch from Jesus Christ is virtuous. And notice it's not just that, but it's done. Not just divine and direct, it's done. Whenever she touches him, straightway. For years and years and years, all the money, all the expense, all the time, all the effort, all the worry, all the anxiety, it's all done. She touches Christ, immediately she's healed. There's no come back in a week and we'll do a scan. There's no take this, you know, and isolate for 14 days and we'll check you again. No, immediately it's done. You want to get better? Touch Jesus. I could have just said that and we could have dismissed. <laughs> you want to get better? Spiritually, touch Jesus. Now that's where the message ends and I want to conclude... There's only one time Jesus said not to touch me. That's in John when he rose from the dead and he said, Touch me not, I've not yet ascended. But Jesus says, hey, reach out and touch me. And I want to encourage you spiritually. Because oftentimes when you get in different situations, and, and I, by far, we have been blessed in this part of the country. Most of us in our church are still able to work and carry on pretty normal and as far as our, our life is going. The other day I was reading a, a magazine that I get periodically and it, it gives different stories of current Christian persecution across the world. And as I read that, I was reading about a, a, a man who was, uh, I think it was in uh, Sudan. He was arrested and he was um, for espionage, you know. He was just visiting Christian pastors over there trying to help them. They put him in jail. They put him in jail with some ISIS prisoners. <laughs> And, of course, they found out he was a Christian. They began to persecute him. They beat him every day. And then they, uh, they had heard, this was back when that waterboarding stuff was going on a few years ago, you know, when they were getting all upset about America, supposedly some things, you know. And so they got him down, and they were starting. And, and it came on a certain day. They, were, they had gotten a hold of some knives, and they were going to kill him. And they moved him, put him in a different cell. And he keeps telling his story. He's in there. I can't remember how long. And then he tells the, the tale. He finally went to court. And, of course, they sentenced him to life in prison. And then two days later, all of a sudden, he's released. And I was reading that story. Then I got to reading about a Korean um, from North Korea. He was down in China. This is back about four years ago. He's down in China and for, for, a, for business. And he met some Christians and got converted. And they're like, hey, why don't you take some Bibles back? He's like, no, I can't do that. You know, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll be put in jail. And then they kept in contact with him, and several years went by, and finally he agreed, and he smuggled in ten Bibles. Well, he was real nervous about it, and finally he got enough nerve, and he heard a guy whistling a Christian hymn that he had learned while he was in China. And he, said, and he saw where the guy went to his house, and he said, I'll take some Bibles and leave them there. And he did. Well, 
long story short, a few more months go by, he winds up getting arrested and put in jail. And he eventually gets out. He doesn't, doesn't die. But what happens is, as a result of those Bibles that went to that one man's house, you had, they had 27 converts to Christianity. However, all 27 of those went to concentration camp in North Korea. So they probably didn't make it. This stuff's recent. And I'm sitting here reading this as I'm eating my grape nuts in my you know, COVID crisis isolation thinking, you know, this, we got this. First world problems. And I'm not downplaying any of our suffering. But I do want to say this about spiritual issues. Because we have been withdrawn spiritually from a congregation which you need. You say, well, it ain't no big deal. We just sit across from the pew and it ain't like we know everybody's business. It's just a small touch. It's just a small thing. It's just knowing there's somebody that believes the same thing you do that's coming out to church each and every week. That small touch matters. That somebody's praying for you when the, your name's called out on the prayer list. That somebody is in your corner. That we are all on the same team and we're trying to do the same thing. That small spiritual touch matters. I'm no pediatrician, but they tell me that these little babies, and I've seen them when you see these newborns come out, they have these big long fingernails, you know, monsters coming out. And uh, they, they take them and they try to cut them, but they can't do that, so they put the little mittens on them, you know. Well, they, they don't want them to stay on there a whole long time because they actually, supposedly through research, have proved that the infant needs to touch because it helps to develop their brain cells. It helps them in their growth to be able to touch and to experience. I just wonder if as Christians when we don't touch Jesus how much that is retarding our growth and prohibiting our spiritual growth. I'm no doctor, I'm no uh, politician, I'm no civic cedar, uh, leader that's telling us all about these rules and all this. I'm a preacher and I'm going to try to help you spiritually. You need to be reaching out to Jesus Christ. I'm not saying you haven't been. But you got that defilement, you've got that sin, you've got that issues, you need to reach out to Him. Amen. We're going to bow our heads for just a moment of prayer. You can stay where you, in your seat instead of coming to the altar. We're going to ask Sister Sherry to play an invitation hymn. Maybe just a small moment of prayer here.